sermon handouts for today. It's just one page today. And so, yeah, yay. You're tired of me speaking so long, John? Thanks for the rousing compliment here. All right, he's messing with me, John. All right. So, yes, it is set up right. I guarantee that with a one pager, that's good. So, you won't get lost today. But we're, we're going to read from the Gospel of Mark, and actually, I believe it's the 10th chapter. I have that listed wrongly. But this is a man who came to Jesus who had leprosy. So this man with leprosy came to Jesus and begged him on his knees. He said, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Jesus was indignant. And so he reached out his hand and touched him. I'm willing, he said, be clean. So immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. So Jesus sent the man away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anybody, but go show yourselves a priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for you, cleansing your cleansing is a testimony to them. But instead of keeping his trap shut, okay, that's not exactly what it says, but said he went out and he began to talk freely, spreading the news. And as a result, Jesus could no longer enter into a town openly, but straight, stayed away in lonely places. Yet people still came to him everywhere. So here ends the gospel of our Lord. So today, uh, today's lesson was actually supposed to be the story of Jesus Res resuscitation or resurrection, I guess you could say, of Lazarus. I would say a resuscitation because resurrection implies permanency to it. Once you're dead and you're gone and then you're raised up from the dead, you stay alive. We will be resurrected from the dead. Jesus was resurrected from the dead. Lazarus was re resuscitated in one sense by God, even though he's clearly dead, but he only, only to die again. But, you know, it does remind me a little bit about that story, since we're not reading today. Uh, you remember he had two brother, or two sisters, Mary and Martha, and he was a caretaker, and they were distraught over his death. And so this is kind of how that story goes. He died, and uh, he probably maybe have been there in heaven, ready to go into heaven and all the rest. And, uh, in fact, God probably looked at him and said these words, uh, Come forth, and I will give you eternal life. And next thing you know it, Dagnabbit, Jesus resuscitates him from the dead, and then he's just got to die again. He goes back and he dies a second time, and he comes up to the kingdom of heaven, and God says, I told you to come forth, and I give you eternal life. Well, he was out of luck. He came fifth and only got a toaster oven. Just saying. Come forth. Come forth, you get eternal life. Come fifth, you're out of luck, you get a toast run. Okay. All right, takes you a while, guys. I know, I know, okay. That is my, my real profession is as a comedian, by the way. You can come down and see me at the Funny Bone any day. All right. So, <laughs> that's right. Well, listen, that is my weekend job, by the way. Okay, let's go on. Today's lessons, actually, the, the story of Lazarus and this story that we just read, really show us a lot about the compassion that Jesus has for people. They both demonstrate the great depth of his mercy and love, his compassion for other people. Now, I want to talk about what mercy is, because we are really starting to take a transition now in our sermons over the course of the next two weeks. We've really talked about how much God has loved you, how, God is, how precious you are to God, and now God wants to change this around. Now that you've been so loved, you are called now to go and take this mercy to other people. But you have to understand what it means to be merciful to other people. Now, to be com really, I think it means to be compassionate. And to be compassionate, as Jesus was in our lesson today, means to enter into other people's pain. That is not the same thing as being empathetic. There are a lot of people that are very empathetic. Well, you can be empathetic and not compassionate. You can actually be compassionate and not empathetic. You can be compassionate and empathetic. But I tell you, my problem is when people say, oh, I feel so sorry for you. You know those types of folks? They come up to you, you lost a loved one, they're in the funeral home, they pat you on the hand. I'm so sorry for you. Anything I can do, I'm there for you. That's just so not true. They're lying to you. They really don't want you to call, do they? They're hoping they can get off scot-free, aren't they? Because if they really were compassionate, they would have offered you something. Listen, can I come out and clean your house on Wednesday? Listen, can I come out and make you a meal on Thursday? Can I do this for you? Can I take your kids to dance class so that you can get done some things that you need to get done? That's 
compassion. Anyway, it's easy to be empathetic. Empathy doesn't do a thing. It's hard to be compassionate. Compassion actually lifts people out of their pain. Empathy just says, oh, I'm so sorry for you. So we want to be compassionate people because that's what Jesus did for us. And our lesson today about the leper, a little bit about leprosy so we can talk about this lesson for today. So lepers were outcasts in the society of Jesus. Now we have lepers in our society, but it's, it's a curable disease for the most part. Now it's not to say that some people don't die from it if they don't get the care that's necessary. But in Jesus' day, it was kind of a death sentence. Now you can live with leprosy for quite a while. You can live 30, 40 years with leprosy. But in Jesus' day, they were outcasts. They were not permitted to touch anybody. They were not permitted to be touched by anybody. They had to live in these leper colonies. Uh, they could, uh, leprosy was also, by the way, this is, really ticks me off, and you're going to see in a minute, it ticks Jesus off. Leprosy was considered to be an outward sign of something that was spiritually wrong with the person who had leprosy. What do I mean by that? If you saw somebody with leprosy, you would look at them and say, oh, what did you do wrong that God cursed you with leprosy? You must have been a bad person. You know, I hate to say it, we actually kind of do that today. No, not entirely. But think about it. We look at poor people and we say, what didn't you do? You just won't get off your butt and help yourself and that's why you're poor. We have the same type of judgmental attitude towards people. No, I'm not going to say that there aren't some poor people who honestly could help themselves and don't. But I would say that for the most part, poor people in this world are poor not because of anything they have or have not done. It's because of the circumstances in which they find themselves in this world. And so we have, we have to be careful of that type of attitude where we indict and dump on people who are already struggling. Oh, you have cancer. That's because you're smoking 10 packs a day. Maybe true. But can't we still care for people even though they're suffering and struggling? Oh, well, you have AIDS because you're gay. And you were just had a prolific lifestyle. By the way, you don't have to be gay to get AIDS. You don't have to have a prolific ice lifestyle uh, to get AIDS either. We have these judgmental attitudes towards people. You must have deserved it. How does that bring people to Jesus? Right? We have to stop this type of indictment of people. This is what we do. People are gay. People have AIDS. People are poor. These types of indictments that we dump on people. Guess who people are gay? Who, people are gay are what? God's kids, aren't they? Yeah. They're, they're God's people. God's God adores them. Who are poor people? People that God loves. It's like Tevye says, God, you must truly love poor people because you've made so many of them, right? There you go. All right. That's right. And we're all beautiful in God's sight. So we go on. But with the, with the uh, lepers, what lepers had to do in Jesus' society is they had to wear a mask. And whenever they went to some place, uh, where the round people, they had to shout these following words, unclean, unclean, as loud as they could. So they were kind of drawing attention to themselves, saying, I'm unclean, I'm a horrible person, and that's the way people treated them. They were dogs. And so this leper in our story for today, what does he do? He comes to Jesus in a public space. Can you imagine? This is crazy. So he comes to Jesus, and you can imagine all these people surrounded by Jesus, and this guy comes in, unclean, unclean, and all of a sudden a big chasm opens up, and allows them to walk up to Jesus because nobody wants to be around them. And Jesus, you know what Jesus does? Here's the amazing thing. He stands his ground. He allows this leper to come up to him, unlike everybody else who's scattered by this point. And so this leper comes up to him in this public place. His failure happened to all. People are probably pointing their finger and saying, oh, let's see what Jesus does with this guy. Let's see Jesus tell this guy off and tell him what a sinner he is. Jesus does something amazing. But this leper, first of all, comes up to Jesus and says, Jesus... If you're willing, will you heal me? Now that's an interesting question. Because oftentimes we say, can you heal me? But he doesn't ask whether or not Jesus can heal him. He knows the answer to that. He knows that Jesus can heal him. But the, he's more than capable. But the leper, what the leper doesn't know is whether or not he's willing to. Because the leper also felt the same way. Can you imagine? And I had this uh, talking with somebody just the other day about abuse. And uh, physical abuse is one thing. 
I've been beat, I've been punched, I know what it's like. I've been knocked down, I've been knocked out, I've been thrown through a plate glass window. All those things have happened to me in my life by a person who was supposed to care for me. Those wounds are all healed. But you know what isn't healed? Are the words that people say to you. You're no good, you're awful, you're terrible, you're this, you're that, you're a bum, you're all the rest. This leper felt horrible about himself because you can imagine for years and years and years and years, people told him you're a bum, you're a sinner, you're awful, you're no good, you're worthless, all these types of things. And so he started to believe it. And so he believed that he was a failure. He believed he was unworthy of the healing of Jesus. But here's what Jesus does for him. I love this. Verse 41. Let me read this to you. Jesus was what? Indignant. He was furious. Not at the leper. you got to be careful. He's not indignant with the leper. He's indignant that this leper was treated the way he was and abused so poorly, treated so poorly by people who should love him. How could people treat this leper like this? Well, he's a sinner. No, he's a child of God who needs to be loved. So Jesus is indignant the way this man has treated him. And so he has, he has empathy for him, but he's got more than empathy. What does he have? It says in the Bible that he was filled with compassion. And he touched the man. Oh, wait a minute. Think about this. Can you imagine spending 15 years of your life, maybe this man had leprosy for 15 years, can you imagine going 15 years of your life never being touched by anybody, never getting a hug or a kiss, never holding hands with somebody, never getting a pat on the back, never getting somebody just kind of come up and smack you on the head, nothing. Nobody will even touch you because you're considered dirty and unclean. Can you imagine living your life like that? Never a touch. Jesus is the first person to touch this guy in years. Jesus risks becoming ritually unclean. He doesn't care because he's Jesus. You know? He looks at this man and he has compassion for him. And he does something that nobody's done for this man in years and years. He treated him like a human being. And he made him clean. So these two stories, I think, show us something spectacular about the mercy of Christ, how compassionate he is towards other people, but they also tell us and show us an example of how we are called to be compassionate towards other people, okay? We too are called to be compassionate because God has been compassionate to us, and I will tell you, this will require a great deal of effort on our part. You can't just throw a dollar in a basket somewhere and say, oh, I've done my duty. We have to at some point get our hands dirty, and it requires us to acknowledge another person's humanity. Now, I'm going to tell you some illustrations about recognizing people's humanity before I get into the last two things. And you all have seen <clears throat> the beggars that you see in the street of Pittsburgh. You know, they're going around, and you probably see this. We see the same people over and over again, don't we? They're at the same places every time. They're always at the football games. They're always at the baseball games. They're, all, they're always at the Penguins games with their hand out hoping to get some money and so forth. So we've seen that, right? Now, we get this real cynical attitude about people who are begging. And we say, well, you know what? They're just a bunch. You know what? They're just, they're not really needy. They're just trying to get money. And I will tell you, my wife and I actually saw an example of that that added to our cynicism. True story. A year ago, we were at one of the pit football games. There was this woman, she was dressed in tattered. She was just dirty and, and filthy, filthy clothes and just looked so worn out and on and on, begging for money, and people were giving her money. And You know, you don't know what to do. What are you supposed to do with those situations? And then I'll tell you what, what I think you should do. But uh, So, we're, you know, you walk by, you're looking at her, and, you know, you just feel compassionate, you want to, or empathy, and you want to do something, maybe throw a buck or two in there. And I don't, we didn't, you know, we didn't, but, you know, after the game, we come out, she's walking around in brand new clothes, walking into a restaurant to get something to eat, her hair looks really nice, and we're like, are you kidding me? For crying out loud, that just adds to your cynicism about this whole process that some of these guys are just out to get your money, and honestly, they're not really in need of it. The problem is, is that there actually are some people who are beggars who desperately could use our money, and a handful of those people who do take add to our cynicism about it, and we say, well, what are we supposed to do? Well, what did Jesus do? He acknowledges another person's 
humanity. Surprise. Throwing a dollar in a person's cup is not acknowledging their humanity. Something else needs to happen with the beggars on the street. So before I go into this last part, I want to tell you what an acquaintance of mine said. I heard him say he actually directs a, uh, a men's shelter in the city of Pittsburgh. And he was actually talking to some pastors and said, when you see people begging on the street, this is what I'm asking you to do. This is from a guy who runs a men's shelter in the city of Pittsburgh. On the north side? Okay, yes. And this is, what, this is what I was told. He said, when you see somebody begging, don't give them a dime. And you're like, well, we pastors are like, what? You know, because that's just some wars against us. Because, you know, we want to help. You know, we'd like to help. We'd like to give a few bucks. And he says, I'm going to tell you why. Because all you're doing is you're exacerbating the problem. If, first of all, if it's somebody who just wants money, then you've just given them what they want. Secondly, if it's actually somebody who's in need, you're just preventing them from getting the help that they need by extending another day of pain for them. He said what they need to do is they need to get to the point where there's no place to turn but to us or to other people that can actually sit down, acknowledge their humanity, and help them. He said, you're not acknowledging their humanity when you throw a dollar in their, in their, in their, in their cup. So you're not acknowledging their humanity. You're not doing anything for them. You're making yourself feel good. And you're extending their pain for another day. Let them come out and seek out the help that they truly need with us so we can actually transform their lives because we will sit down and help them. And I said, okay. Just as a, something you might want to consider the next time you see folks on the street. Now, I know it's uncomfortable. Uh, and unfortunately, that word is never going to get around. It's obviously profitable enough in one sense that they continue to beg and stay on the streets instead of really seeking the help that they might truly need, which might be addiction counseling or other type of help to get them... Uh, off the streets and in a situation where they can make a living or the psychiatric care that they might need, whatever the circumstance might be. And so until then, we kind of create those things, those avoidance techniques that we have. You know what they are? So you're walking along and you see somebody and, and you kind of run up to a back of a group of, another group of people so they don't see you, so you don't have to look them in the eye, right? You ever done that? Or have you done this thing of, oh, look, I'm actually looking this way, and you kind of walk by them so you don't have to look at them. You know, we do those types of avoidance techniques. Avoidance technique, techniques. We're not helping the situation. And the problem is we're not acknowledging their humanity. We need to find a way to connect them with the help that they truly need. So that requires us, this next one, we need to truly take the time to touch people and care for people if we're going to transform their lives. We've got to know them. You're not going to get to know somebody and transform their life by throwing a dollar in their cup. We've got to do more than that. And so look at this last one. So what we need to do is follow through to see that people truly are lifted out of their pain. So maybe you are not called to help the person on the street begging for money. That's probably not what you're called to do. But I can promise you that there are people that God has put in your life recently that you can help lift out of their pain and out of their circumstances. This week has been a truly interesting week, especially in preparation for the sermon, because I've had three or four cases where people have come to me with significant concerns, and I've been in a position to help. Dang, nabbit. And I say that because, remember, you can be compassionate, but sometimes not always empathetic. And so I will confess, I was not always empathetic this week with the circumstances that I found myself in where people needed help. Because there were times that I was trying to find, figure out a way, how can I get out of this? But then you realize, I can't get out of this because I'm the person on call who needs to be here for this person. I'm the one person in the world who can help these people. So God had to do what? Change my attitude. <laughs> because it was, I was a stinker. I was... I was a bum. I was the one that needed to have my attitude changed so I could help the people that needed to be helped in their time of need. It can be a pain because one guy in particular probably took about 10 hours of my time this week that I could have better spent somewhere else, okay? But God said, you're in position. You're about the only person. He considers me his pastor. Okay, struggling with a lot of psychological issues, some other issues. He considers me his pastor. I'm his last line of defense. He doesn't know where else to go. He's never stepped foot in this church ever in his life. That's not true. 
He'll step foot in this church as long as nobody else is here. Okay, you have some true social anxieties, some other things. I get that. We have a lot of people who have social anxieties that we deal with, that struggle with being around people. That's why I like kind of the small setting here for the service. It kind of helps with people who maybe struggle with that. So we get that. But uh, so he's been in this church when nobody else is around, and I'm considered his pastor, and I was his last line of defense. I need help. So what am I going to do? I got this chip on my shoulder. I'm the one that needs to change my attitude. I got to help him. And oh well, all those things that I want to do, I want to visit some of the shut ins this week. I want to do this. His need was truly crucial. And so I served it. And then I'm hearing, now that doesn't make me a good guy. I'm not a good guy. I just happen to be in the right place at the right time and the person with the skills to do it. God has put you in the right place at the right time in somebody's life. You can do the exact same thing. So again, not to pat you on the back either. That's just what people of compassion do. We help people in need because we've been blessed by God. So I'm asking you today and this week to pray about those people that God has put in your life. They're going to require some time from you. It's going to be a pain in the butt. You might not be very empathetic towards their situation, but God has called us to be compassionate and to lift them out of their pain. I'm going to invite us to, to bow our heads in prayer at this time. Heavenly Father, yes, yeah, sometimes we're not always empathetic towards others around us, and some of us just don't have a lot of empathy in our hearts. But you still call us to be compassionate, to help lift people out of their pain. We don't have to feel it. Compassion is not a squishy feeling inside for other people. It's a looking at a person in their circumstance of life and saying, I can help with that. I can help lift them out of that situation. And using a little bit of our time, a little bit of our financial resources, a little bit of what we have to give to help them in their time of need. God, because you've done that for us, help us be compassionate for others. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to close with a song today.